it is quite something, the beginnings. What they had experienced and the toughness of everything. All these mothers came out, they had to travel by ox wagon, and how they wanted to spread our charism. In those early years, it was tough. Now in those days, they had to get on that ox wagon and they had to go uphill and down. You can imagine climbing into Lesotho and then going up to Johannesburg, but the sisters did it. For me, they were pioneers. By the end of the year in Peter Maris, but when they arrived here in 1875, by the end of the year, they had these different groups of the Holy Family going. Plus, they had a few candidates for religious life for the Holy Family already. The tremendous way that they spread the charism was too beautiful. The sisters right down through the years dedicating themselves to the education. In some places where I was, we got great support from the bishops. And they were anxious to promote education in South Africa. The way in which the Holy Family Sisters came here um, many years ago, they've certainly done a tremendous job in making that Catholic ethos, that particular spirituality of the Holy Family Sisters, that idea that our schools, our institutions, their schools, their institutions, have to be have the feel of a family about them. I must say, I enjoyed my teaching years very much. And I taught practically everything that was on the syllabus at our schools. I taught in Durban for many years at Morristella Convent, mostly teaching senior girls, although I was keen to teach little ones. Their spirit and what they stand for is important in every single decision that we make here as a school. I have been working at Morristella for just over 20 years, but I've been principal here for five. The sisters have been incredibly supportive of me as a principal. We see them as being a hugely important aspect to our school. However, as you know that they they're not involved in the school anymore, but they do come and visit. And when they come and visit, we celebrate what they are and who they are, their lives and what they have given to us and what they've left for us, the role model that they are actually to us as a school. Their whole charism of being, of serving people, of community, of living a life of good values and good morals, that is brought in not only in RE lessons, it's brought in in our assemblies and it's brought in in maths classrooms, in life sciences classrooms, in PE, in everything to remind the girls. St. Teresa's Convent School began in town in President Street. Here in Coronationville, it started in 19, 1952. Initially, we were Holy Family Sisters. Holy Family Sisters um, ran the school and Holy Family Sisters were the staff of the school. Afterwards, the uh, sister, sisters withdrew and went to different to other ministries. So the principals that were here, it was Sister uh, uh, Mari, Sister uh, Borgia. Even though we were a Catholic school, the um, number of Catholic wasn't very high. But so the ethos of the school was maintained throughout. And um, we went from, from strength to strength as far as uh, working, not only that we didn't just remain in the school and working among our Catholic families, we, we, were, we reached out to different families, different religious, different denominations, and um, that for me was, was very exciting. People seemed to have appreciated the um, education that they got, they seem to be very happy. It was always a, a good, uh, good name that we had here uh, at, at St. Teresa's in the different communities. My experience with the sisters, my group to love, it was just awesome to, to get to know the sisters. They were people like us, ordinary people who chose to dedicate their lives to their course and 
You could only but admire them for what they've done. I got to know so many sisters from when I was a little girl and we had catechism at church. The sisters were always there. I don't know where our society, especially the one I'm living in right now, and the areas surrounding the school, where we, where would we have been if the sisters hadn't been in our lives, if the school hadn't been here? So the sisters were a godsend. I teach at St. Teresa's Convent School. I'm also an old girl. I was at primary school with the Holy Family Sisters, and I have very, very fond memories of my time with them. Uh, in primary school. One of my teachers, Sister Nanciata, an Irish sister, she was like a grandmother to all of us. The great sense of family is what I experienced most. Even though we were so different, there was that sense of unity in our diversity. All the meditations, the masses, the um, prayer services which we have at school are very, very meaningful, not only for me as a teacher, but especially for the children. Some of them come from single families, some of them come from broken families. And this sense of family is really what means so much to them. What they get here, they can take with them later on into their lives. And that is what I am deeply grateful for, that I can pass this on to them and I can be part of their journey. As a Holy Family sister, I've lived our charism of building communion, mainly through the teaching ministry. I studied to be a kindergarten teacher and then spent many years in the kindergarten class teaching grade one, grade two. I was teaching in St. Teresa's in Coronationville when I was very aware of children in the class who were making very slow progress and who I didn't seem to reach because of brighter children and children who seemed to make good progress. So I one day said to myself, spend the rest of your life doing something for these children. So I studied remedial education through UNISA and was then sent to St. John Bootman's in Orlando East, Soweto. Here I did only remedial work. It was very rewarding. I very often had young boys at the age of 17 who were classified to be in grade 5 and yet they, they struggled. I worked with them over a number of years and it was amazing the way they made good progress and were eventually able to join the mainstream of education. I'm a teacher here at St. John Bishman's. I was fortunate enough to meet Sister Kathleen, Sister Merrill and Sister Devney. They were like mothers to us. They taught us so many things, how to work with people, how to teach learners, how to make teaching aids. You know, there are things that I never knew about the Catholics because I, I'm non-Catholic. But after arriving here, I've learned so much. We used to work hand in hand with the sisters. We were very happy with the Holy Family sisters and all that. He used to help us with the remedial classes and all that. So that is why that build, this building was built because of that, because of the Holy Family Sisters. Sister Kathleen will help us with the remedial classes. So we had a happy, happy, happy time with the Holy Family Sisters. We used to go to their convent as well at Park Town, where we had our retreats there for the, maybe for, for a day or for the night, all because of the Holy Family Sisters. I've been very lucky in the Holy Family, actually, because um, for the first 11 years of my uh, ministry as a teacher, I taught whites only, you know, because there was apartheid. Next 12 years, Indians only. <laughs> After that, I taught African children in South Africa for 22 years. I taught... Uh, Basutu children in Bloemfontein, 
Then I taught, um, I also taught Sepedi children in Lukau. So I taught Zulu children for 11 years. And I think for me that was the most wonderful thing because it made me realize that we're all exactly the same. So I, I was lucky to have that experience and also to be with uh, staff of the different schools who I felt I was just one with. We were one together uh, for the sake of the students, you know. My entire family practically came to the school, my brothers and my sisters, and my daughter and my nieces and nephews also came to the school. So we have a long, long history here. And the kind of Catholic ethos and upbringing and the virtues that we were taught here at the school, all those wonderful times we were taught through the sisters here at, at the school. sisters came to South Africa. But the first 10 years of their arrival in South Africa, Bishop Jolivet was the superior and he was provincial, acting provincial of the Holy Family Sisters as well as the Oblates. But when the Holy Family Sisters got their own provincial, they came out in 1875, by 1885, they had Mother Marcel Mouzet, who came out from France as the provincial. And she took them in a different trajectory. So it was not the oblates who started the nursing. It was an oblate who said, I know sisters who can come and promote uh, medical care in South Africa. And that's why the Holy Family Sisters actually were invited to South Africa. And so they opened the first hospital on the Fitzwatersrand in Johannesburg. And the nursing career continued. So you had the Kensington Sanatorium when they moved out of the General Hospital. And they also were invited to Cape Town and they built a hospital in Cape Town. When they moved out of um, the Kensington Sanatorium, as they called it, in Johannesburg, they had built a new hospital in Parktown called Kenridge Hospital. It's now Donald Gordon Hospital. We were the first sisters for the nursing in South Africa. Our sisters worked in the General Hospital and started the General Hospital in Johannesburg. There were little huts at the beginning and you know what it's now. And then our sisters moved to Cape Town and the same in Cape Town. The, you know, they, left, they definitely left a legacy you know, from their work. Well, I came, I came to South Africa in 63, and I finished my studies, and I went straight to the job of Jen to do my training. I was there for three and a half years, and I went for a very short period to Ken San, which was the hospital there in Joburg, and then I was transferred to Cape Town to Seapoint, uh, to the Monastery Nursing Home, which was um, our hospital, but we, uh, we were looking after the sailors. I came to South Africa as a missionary in 1959, and uh, I trained as a nurse and a midwife, and uh, I was a nurse in several hospitals. The main one in, in Johannesburg was uh, Cambridge Hospital, and I was actually there for 25 years. The last few years, I was pastoral care visitor in the hospital. The care and the apostolic activities with nursing and education has been bringing the uh, Holy Family Spirit into uh, the lives of people. You know, we look at a bicentenary. Actually, we're only 154 years here in South Africa of those 200 years. And yes, there's phenomenal things that have been done 
in terms of sacrifice, commitment, loyalty, uh, giving uh, over, over these years. There were different works developing besides the traditional education and health institutional work. These things kind of gave hope. And so it's interesting to see how religious life has changed uh, since Vatican II. Um, in some cases, the big call to be in the context, the ultimate space, the joys and the sufferings of people need to be out, we need to hold them. As the sisters uh, saw the need, they responded. Uh, similarly, as our founder did after the French Revolution, wherever he saw a need, women came and uh, joined him and became part of the group, part of Holy Family, then he then um, responded to that need with their uh, collaboration. With other ministries, we've got involved with supporting the diocese, pastoral work, social work, community development, helping with pressures um, and formation of ministry school teachers in townships and rural areas. So that is kind of uh, helps us to evolve in terms of where the need is greatest. I qualified as a social worker and I worked for mental health. After that, I'm now working for Catholic Women's League adoptions in the field of social work. Being family and trying to form family with other people is life-giving for me. I interact with people from all walks of life, people from different cultures, and I, I really am happy serving in South Africa. I'm a social worker by profession, and what inspires me to work at the Dennis Sully Center is the work with homeless people. And when I started, the whole focus was around helping homeless people to come off the street and to get into some sort of employment. And so then I started doing life skills training, which is a sort of a step up program. For me, what I do is because I'm a Holy Family sister. It's become part of who I am. That's why I used to work with children. I'm a teacher by profession. And then I got involved in pastoral work and very much um, in the parish as well as in the school. And now I visit the elderly people and I'm also involved in the Dennis Hurley Centre and in the Cathedral Parish, which is a multicultural uh, parish. And um, it's good because you can reach many people. I worked according to the people's need in different situations. My work included child and youth care worker, catechetical coordinator and early childhood development teachers training. I am working with these women, those who are looking after children in their crashes. My aim is to empower and equip these women with the skills and knowledge. It is a good opportunity to share, to live and witness our charism of living communion. So last year, actually, I was 41 years in the Holy Family, in which I'm very happy and proud. When I finished school, the sisters took us to Elanskop. Elanskop is where I, that's where I trained. This is my diamond jubilee. So I am full of excitement of having lived all these years in different missions and quite a few times here in Elanskop which is really lovely to live in. I've been in Inanskop since 2013. What has been life-giving for me has been uh, the community itself, uh, the support you're getting from the sisters, the ministries. Uh, the ministry that I've been involved in is uh, a nursing, basically uh, home-based care, uh, but it's more the support that we get uh, from uh, each other. Uh, as community. Community, as Priscilla was saying, that you're able to come and share. That, that's what I find very uh, fulfilling in Holy Family because as a family, you come and say, sisters, what do you think? Everybody will get involved now. Tell me, when can I, how can I help you? And you have to like a workshop and then and you find everybody putting in their little bit. What uh, 
gives us energy, what gives us something that the spirit to go forward is our charism, the charism of uh, communion. Uh, there's so much division, there's so much uh, family breakdowns in, in the area, but there is still energy and there's still love and they're still kind of wanting to do not only catechize, not only full of people with inspiration, but give them some kind of hope because we live in a very sad HIV AIDS area and we also live in great poverty. And they've got a great lot of children who come to school hungry every day, even though that we try our best and we've got all sorts of schemes going. We still know that they're still in this time and age that there are children living with only granny pension supporting them. So as we as a group have really tried to inspire the people to go beyond that. And I think for us, it's that charism that we bring uh, we think that uh, we dying in South Africa, dying out as a congregation, but the spirit is still, the spirit of the founder is still alive and has meaning in today's world. Because we are an association of the Holy Family. Besides religious sisters, we also have secular institutes, we have lay associates, we have priest associates, we have children of the Holy Family. Way back in 1973, I first was introduced to the Holy Family Sisters down in Wentworth. I was a catechist and I met the Apostolic Sisters and I was very attracted to their way of life, their simplicity, their commitment to the community, very poor community of Wentworth, and their commitment to the people. Through their inspiration, I grew to love um, working with little children, and I came to understand that this was also a gift I have to nurture and care for young children. In 1977, I was down in Cape Town, and Sister Mari Bergen, uh, who was then the provincial, she came out to Cape Town and she introduced to us the lay associates, because in South Africa, up until that point of time, there were only the apostolic sisters. People started to, to show an interest in gaining formation, in becoming lay associates. And so you saw in the 80s people making a commitment for life. I made my commitment in the association in 1987. So, so in the 80s, there were many lay associates. As I said, wherever the sisters were, in Cape Town, there were many houses of the sisters and so many groups. In Johannesburg, in Peter Maritzburg, Elanskop, um, Fosleros, um, Durban, there were many, many groups at, at that point in time. I've been working at Holy Family College since 2013 and uh, at Holy Family College I then became interested in the Holy Family Association. One of the branches is that of the priest associates and I was thinking of joining so I started talking. One of the people I started talking to was Sister Joy and she said she was also thinking of asking me to become a priest associate. I am a Dalsison priest from the Diocese of Bethlehem in the Free State. I will remain a Dalsison priest, but become an associate. And for me, I, I like the idea that the branches are equal. Priests are not higher up in the hierarchy. And I'm very interested to take on this journey with the Holy Family associates. In the Holy Family of Bordeaux, the family of Pierre Bienvenu Nawai, we have five branches. And one of these branches is the consecrated secular branch. These are women who feel called to live the Holy Family's spirituality and charism. And 
make vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but the vows, they don't make it publicly like we do. They come together when it's time to make vows, and they do it privately because of this discretion with regard to their vocation. They don't live in community. They don't come together like we do under one roof. They remain in the world. They keep their jobs. They can live at home or they can live on their own. And their role and their vocation is the vocation of any Christian, any baptized, confirmed person, to make Jesus known. We do it through proclaiming. They do it through the witness of their life. And uh, for them, it's like to be the, the leaven in the dough, the yeast in the dough, and in a way to impregnate society with gospel values through the way they live. They are independent of us, and uh, they look after themselves. They, they don't depend on our communities to keep them. Up to recently, we were their formators as uh, apostolic sisters. But when they got in enough perpetually vowed people in their group, they could take on their own formation. But always, we are resource people to them. Here in South Africa, we have six consecrated seculars. They are all in vows, but some are in perpetual vows, some are having to renew each year. And uh, we have three in Cape Town, we have two here in Johannesburg, and one in Peter Maritzburg. My journey uh, into initial formation um, began 14 years ago. Um, we had a um, congregational continental meeting and there it was decided that we would have an African English-speaking novitiate in South Africa. The place that was chosen was Fosteros and it was to cater for novices from Botswana, Uganda, Lesotho, South Africa. And when uh, English became the official language in Rwanda, then the novices from the Rwanda joined us here. South Africa was no stranger to formation because shortly after the sisters arrived, young women began to approach the sisters about becoming Holy Family Sisters. And the first novitiate was in Bel Air in KwaZulu Natal. And so, in, um, when I was asked to come here to Fosleros um, and to be with the novices, I, I saw it as an opportunity to help people to grow in their relationship with Jesus and with God. And during that time, I also um, had a training as a spiritual director. And this was something that also has given me great joy. Uh, again, it is helping people in their relationship with God. And um, that I find it's um, a privilege for me. And it's also something that gives me great joy. Also being with young people and young people from many different cultures was um, a very enriching experience for me. The idea that attracted me was the idea of family. And it's not only family within the church or within the association, but family very broadly, the human race as a family. And also that we are part of creation, that we are the creation and evolution is not a background to human development, but that we are part of that. And I think with this climate change, we are starting to realize it. And I hope it's not too late that we are part of creation, we are part of this human race and we've got a responsibility towards creation. For me, the Vatican Council was a crucial 
point in the history of the church, especially in the modern age, where Pope John XXIII said that the church should become part of the world, and be part of the world, not above it, not aside it, or below it, but part of it. And that, of course, is a very big challenge for many of us in the church, in society, in the world, it's not only from the church's side, but also from the world side. How do you accept a church that used to be separate, used to see itself as different, as better, as more holier, and now I think we have to see that we are part of this world. And for me, I think the Holy Family Associate will help me on this journey in my ministry. The opening up of what we call the new universe story. For me personally, it gave great scope to my passion for good news, for proclaiming God's good news of love, of love for the world, not distance from the world. And um, the new story is based on the evolving universe discoveries of the past hundred years. And that's given me more life than I could ever have hoped for. Together, as an international body, we've moved um, into a, this new era, as the Pope calls it. And we are excited about the scope we're given to refound our charism of communion. Today, the big need is our, our, our earth, how we're taking care of our environment, that um, we form family not only with our species, but we form family with all life, with all of creation. We, we welcome and we acknowledge that we too are welcomed by everything that lives because we know that we live with an interdependence with all of creation. We live with an interrelatedness and an interconnection of all life. And so we've come to learn and appreciate this aspect of our lives that, you know, while in the early days we, we would go on and talk about we, we are nourished by the same sap and we would consider the books that we, we share together. We would consider the Eucharist, which is very much core to our lives. But now we've opened our minds and hearts to say, we bring everything in. We embrace everything. We embrace all of creation. You know, the tree is, is, is very much a focal thing in creation for us because we are who we are because of our founder's dream. Our founder looking and contemplating a tree and seeing the association depicted in a tree, all the branches, contemplatives, apostolics, seculars, lay associates, and priest associates, all contained in this tree. And he said, this tree bore all kinds of fruit. And our founder said, birds of every color, birds of every species, found their food on this tree. And they all sang out in unison, glory to God. been working for the sisters since 1987. I like my work. The sisters, they trust me and I trust them. Sisters, they are like my family because all the time when you've got a problem, I always tell the sisters and then we sit down and talk. I met the Holy Family Sisters very early on in my education because they taught me in class one and class two at the Holy Family Convent in Peter Maritzburg. And there were two wonderful sisters, Sister Veronica and Sister Kieran. They were 
kindness personified and gentle and very loving. I think we were all in love with them. I didn't have much contact with them for quite a while till I was at the cathedral and I met people like Sister Dolores. Sister Dolores was the parish sister and I could see what a wonderful contribution she made in a very quiet way. She was the kind of go-to person for anybody who had a problem. And she was at the cathedral for, I don't know, three decades, I think. Later on, she was followed by Sister Marion, who was in charge of catechetics, very friendly to people, very interested in their lives and their stories, and always very helpful. So one got to this kind of picture of the, the great role that sisters, parish sisters can play. Now, the priests are a little bit distant in some ways from their parishioners, but the sisters get very, very close, and, and I was very struck by that. I heard a lot about Sisters for Justice, uh, in which Sister Sheila Mary was a, probably the key player, and it was a relatively, and I think still is, relatively small organization, but it manages to do wonderful things and to make a great contribution to the struggle for justice within the Catholic Church. And so I was very impressed with that and inspired by the work that Sisters for Justice did and still do. And Sister Bridget Flanagan was the principal of this school here. Um, Holy Family Convent, which is now the Diaconia Center. And she met Father Hurley when he came back from Rome in 1940. He had just been ordained. She thought he was painfully shy, but her superior introduced Father Hurley to Sister Bridget, and they were good friends. So this, was, this started in 1940, so Sister Bridget Flanagan was a, quite a major player in the, in the life of Dennis Hurley and then Bishop Hurley and then Archbishop Hurley. They were on the same wavelength about um, issues of justice in South Africa, particularly about the schools being integrated. Having thought about our congregation, our group, celebrating a bicentenary, I had a, a stint earlier on in the 80s um, during the heavy apartheid times as leader. But looking back at 200 years and just thinking with regard to being the leader of a holy family unit, it's, it's extremely uh, interesting to find that in the 80s, we were easily just over 200 here in the unit. And then when I got it now, 2012, we were about 30-something to be a leader of a religious congregation. It is um, to be as sensitive as possible as to how the Word of God, how Jesus' way of life can be passed on, experienced, interpreted in the context in which the person is living. And people can often say now, to us, how do you feel about the future? A religious life in the, in the whole world, never mind South Africa, seems to be declining. We've had many gatherings where we've spoken about this. Nothing goes on and on and on forever. I joined the congregation when it was flourishing and in the 60s and 70s, there were quite a number of vocations. Then all of a sudden, people were leaving. People were asking questions. Uh, religious life started changing. So what gives hope in these kind of situations? It is not so much that we reproduce what was as to live the very now moment. And it, in living it at the age of 30 or the age of 70, it's two different kinds of living in a way, but what I, what I am at either of those uh, particular phases of life 
is the important thing. For me, it is diminishment, yes, or we, we can see it, of a particular kind of religious life. And there's a whole new different era. And I do believe that a seed has been planted, and as St. Paul says, somebody's going to water it, somebody's going to watch it grow, and somebody's going to harvest. We're not there to do everything. And it's producing something that maybe we don't recognize. And for me, that is, is what gives me gives me hope. You know, when you hear the people talking about all the good that the sisters have done, you know, we certainly have touched people. I have cried many tears with the people. I've laughed many laughs with the people. I've enjoyed being with them. And for the future, I hope that that will continue. When our numbers have been greatly reduced, but we still are involved in whatever we can do, we still try to do and help where we can with our limited resources. I mean, I would like to see the Holy Family growing in South Africa, but the reality is we're getting very old and try to live the mission and the charism as best we can. Our mission and our charism is to tell the world that communion is possible. We're all striving towards building communion among the people of God, with the people of God. I think the communion is very much greater now than it was in the older days, possibly because we're smaller, but also I think it's the general changes in society and in the church. There's a call for much letting go so that something new can emerge. And my hope would be that we would be like a bridge that would uh, lead from the old form of religious life into something that is new and that is more part of Africa than religious life is at present. We have to move. We have to move on if we're going, not only if we're going to be relevant, but if our charism is going to have any meaning for our world, our country today.